Hello, everyone, and welcome back to the Centre for Legal Innovations reInvent Legal Business Series. We are absolutely delighted today to welcome Peter Dobkins to chat about something that he's definitely a guru in and uh, loves, I know, um, project management under pressure. We wanted to add the second part to, uh, to the title, Under Pressure, because we are at the moment obviously all looking at our projects and managing them in um, a bit of a pressure cooker environment. We really couldn't think of anyone better than Peter to, um, to tackle this topic for us today. As you can see from the slide deck, uh, Peter is an adjunct associate professor and also a director at PwC New Law. He's also one of our geeky gurus at the uh, Legalpreneurs Lab. Um, so uh, we have had a long association with Peter and absolutely delighted uh, that he could be with us today. So welcome, Peter. Thank you very much, Terry, for the very kind and warm introduction. And Hello, everyone out in the interwebs. Um, let's get cracking. Um, what we're going to cover off in this, uh, as I so called, hour of power. Uh, let's start having a look at some causes of pressure, where this pressure is coming from, both from a, an external macro perspective, but also an internal projects perspective. Um, then we're going to have a look at what the impact of that pressure actually is upon our ability to make decisions within a project context. Uh, We'll have a look at some strategies for managing project pressure. Uh, spoiler alert, it's project management, but we'll get into that. And uh, finally, look at some uh, leadership strategies for how to uh, lead projects during uh, a crisis. So <laughs> let's have a look at some causes of pressure. Uh, now, <laughs> if you could think back as far as only in G. Well, back in January, when we only had bushfires and floods to contend with uh, as compared to the present world, but there was this uh, report released by PwC. It's a global CEO survey, and I identified a range of uh, external macro pressures that are, that are facing organizations and obviously affect the context within which projects occur. Uh, so you can see there, uh, CEOs at the time were concerned about economic growth. Well, there was a degree of portent about that. They were concerned about not having access to the relevant skills that they needed, uh, fears of the accelerated rate of technology growth. Um, climate change was obviously a, a hot, bad pun, hot topic at the time. Uh, and the degree of trust uh, in, in corporates and in government. Uh, you could really summarise, if you haven't heard of the concept or the acronym uh, PESTLE, before. It's a really useful, neat acronym for helping to uh, identify some large macro pressures. It stands for political, economic, social, technological, legal, and environmental. Uh, just a little, uh, little handy hint for when you're doing risk management and to help you identify some different types of pressures. So there's a range of external macro pressures affecting Australia and you know, more broadly. Uh, and none of these should really come as a surprise. Uh, of course, layered on top of that, we have the pressures of our emergent profession. Uh, we've seen, you know, there's a theory uh, or an academic area called institutional theory, which plots the progress of professions. And we have been uh, institutionalizing and corporatizing as a legal profession since even the, the 50s and 60s. Uh, really accelerated, obviously, in the 2008, post-2008 period. Uh, and due to a range of technological, social, regulatory market pressures summarised. We've got uh, six vectors of change as summarised by Professor Katz that I've got up on screen. And so these shouldn't really come as any surprise to you again. Uh, you know, we're now seeing in particular concepts like the T-shaped lawyer, uh, which some of you may have heard of me and others speak about previously, where it's no longer enough just to be a pure black letter lawyer uh, and study the pre-C11. Increasingly, we're expected to be aware of a broad range of other areas, including things like project management, change management, uh, product development, data analytics. Uh, so yeah, it's, it's lawyer plus. So we've got these emergent professional professionals as well. Uh, in fact, there was an article put out by uh, Cohen in Forbes, uh, I think uh, late last year, where he really well, really articulated this uh, division within the, the profession of law and the business of law, and people really trying to get a handle on that. So we've got those pressures as a profession as well. Um, and well, 
the <laughs> those pressures were really neatly brought to the fore by this piece of um, research by the World Economic Forum. Uh, it was their Future of Jobs report published in 2018. Um, you may not have seen this. Uh, I came across it recently. I was presenting to the uh, Managing Partners Forum uh, just a couple of months ago in Queensland. Uh, and you might notice in the top left corner, stable roles, uh, managing directors and chief executives, which is why I brought this slide up to a room full of managing partners that made them feel very happy about themselves. But you might want to have a look at where lawyers sit. Um, according to the World Economic Forum, we are a redundant role. Uh, and bear in mind, this is published in 2018. Their time measure is 2018 to 2022. So we've got two years before we become redundant. And if that wasn't concern enough, look at the company we're keeping, telemarketers and door-to-door -door sales workers. So if that's not pressure on a profession, I don't know what is. And of course, the profession's looking to move. Uh, there's an interesting piece of research done by Altman Wheel last year with their chief uh, CLO survey uh, of 2019, where it did ask uh, a range of in-house counsel and CLOs, GCs, what initiatives they were doing to try and change. And you can see there for yourself a range of internal efficiency initiatives, uh, in internal and external cost control initiatives. Uh, interesting to point out that, you know, so just to kind of take you through what the graphs mean, um, the, the vertical bars represent the percentage of respondents that were actually trying said approach, and the line indicates of those people that tried it, the percentage that actually uh, got some benefit or felt that it was a useful thing to do. So the ones highlighted in orange, they're basically the keeping up with the Joneses. That's, uh, that's what a lot of in-house legal teams are doing right now. You know, their technology tools, they're improving their efficiency, you know, the efficiency of their internal processes. Uh, they're requiring their external counsel to have budgets. Uh, but more interestingly is uh, areas like, for example, you can see their project management at the top where less than 20% said that they were trying it. But of those tr that tried it, uh, well over 50%, so nearly 60% of those respondents said that actually it was a really useful thing to do. Uh, and the same again with uh, actually uh, training lawyers to actually enforce outside council budgets. And uh, at the bottom, you can see outsourcing uh, to to non-law uh, firm vendors. You know, not many trying it, but a significant benefit if, for those that do. So they're the ones where you really get to push the needle and move, kind of step apart from your competitors. So just an interesting piece of research for you there. Um, and of course, well, wouldn't be a conversation about project managing under pressure if we didn't mention uh, COVID. And I particularly like the, if you haven't seen it before, the meme on the on uh, screen left, uh, yeah, who's actually, who actually achieved digital transformation. Was it your CEO, your CTO? No, it was COVID, wasn't it? It's achieved the biggest transformation we've probably seen in the profession. Uh, and not just ours, but many knowledge workers and uh, other sectors. Uh, this piece of analysis actually is done by uh, Morrison uh, Fuster, which are a very large uh, international law firm based in North America. Uh, so a recent piece of analysis. And I found it fascinating when you're looking at some of the pressures uh, and changes that are resulting from that. Uh, so if we look at the top graph there on the right-hand side, you know, 90, uh, over you know, 95, 98% uh, you know, moving to remote work environments, they're cancelling internal events. This is really going to affect how you manage and deliver a project, right? And manage your team. Uh, then you've also, well, in 20, nearly 20% of cases, the, the business stopped. That's going to affect your project. Or uh, with nearly 13% where key individuals or individuals were actually laid off or taking extended, forced to take leave, that's going to affect the resourcing of your team, right? So these, these pressures do manifest in palpable impacts upon project delivery. And I found even more fascinating was the graph down the bottom where we start looking at what the personal biggest challenges to people was in this area. And you can see up there, you know, making decisions in uncertain environments, you know, 55%, managing a remote team. This is all this is all project management, right? 27%. Yeah, keeping my team focused, 15, nearly, nearly 17%. And yeah, providing advice on unknown issues. So you haven't really planned the stuff before. It's not there's not a ready made template. It's a one of one. You're, you're venturing into the unknown, you know, two third, nearly two thirds of respondents. So Really interesting to see how the new pressures of, of COVID-19 are affecting palpably people and how they act and how they deliver projects. So, but let's have a look at some of that, some of the macro external pressures. Let's have a look at some of the 
internal pressures uh, for, and when I say projects, I of course I'm referring generally to legal projects. Uh, for those of you who have uh, had the pleasure, I would like to think of sitting through my project legal project management training, and uh, you would know this for those that haven't. Uh, all legal matters are projects by definition. They have a start point, an end point, and an objective. So uh, we could go into a lot more detail, but as a very simple definition of a project, all legal matters are projects. Uh, so let's just talk about legal matters or projects for a moment. What are some of the sources of internal pressure for them? Well, at the project level, it's all about expectations and constraints. Um, so perhaps you know, unclear or changing scope and the fact that that will usually cause a degree of rework. Um, some, something that almost everyone will have been, I can almost feel you guys nodding in the background here, virtually unrealistic timelines or budgets. Uh, not that that ever happens, uh, but of course, is a significant source of, uh, of pressure. Um, another one, not having actual sufficient access to or control of the resources you need or the data and information you need to get the job done. So having to go back to the business and really try and scrape out information from another internal team. Or if you're in private practice, trying to get information begrudgingly given to you from a client. or if you've got, you thought, say, in private practice environment and you thought you had a resource, but now they've actually been taken off your project uh, because of partner pulled rank and they pulled the resource onto someone else. So that can cause a lot of, a lot of stress and uh, a lot of pressure. Um, of course, then we have the uh, variable stakeholder engagement or conflict. We'll have a look at uh, the placeholder on that. We're going to have a look at uh, the, uh, the, um, the interest versus influence matrix for stakeholder management. You know, not often, oftentimes the stakeholders you wish were more engaged with you just aren't. Uh, or you know, horror upon horror horrors if the stakeholders actually are in conflict with each other. Um, perhaps in an in-house environment where you're in a large corporate, you might have different in-house teams. Yeah, you know, uh, kind of to uh, if not blaming each other, but not co collaborating in the best way that they could. Um, we have some of the pressures of just managing high-performing teams. Lawyers, they're A-types. They can be difficult to manage sometimes, um, let, alone, you know, let alone if we have some barristers. Uh, no offence to any barristers on the call at this point in time. Uh, and then, of course, tracking tasks. The whole lying up, lying awake at night and wondering, what have I forgotten? You know, what, what bit of information, what email did I miss? What task did I miss? And just trying to keep that bandwidth and trying to – Remember all of that, all of that content, and afraid that if we forget it, of course, um, you know, that may have significant commercial or even professional consequences. So that's at the project level, and then if we step back and go more at the portfolio level, so say at a departmental level or a practice area level, um, oftentimes we hear from GCs uh, or from practice area heads. Yeah, they they want oversight. Yeah, they have not. They want to know who's doing what. What's their team up to? They just don't know, and they don't have oversight oversight uh, over necessarily. Particularly, um, even more so now when uh, they don't even have literal line of sight. And now everyone's in you know work from home environment. So trying to actually find out who is doing what can be quite a pressure. Uh, closely related to that is then trying to right source and optimally resource uh, teams, or you know the private con private practice concept of utilization and trying to maximize utilization. Uh, and finally, the integrations and the boundaries, making sure that things don't get dropped between the cracks, between different practice areas or between projects. So there's some sources of internal pressure for, for legal matters. Uh, and a lot of these that I've just said are actually correlated by a piece of analysis done by the International Legal Technology Association in their white paper of uh, just about a year ago now. They did a white paper on project management. And you start to see what some of the areas um, that the respondents thought uh, project management had the biggest impact upon and some of the biggest benefits. And you can see there's actually a pretty close corollary between the pressures and it's effectively, it's like the, uh, the disease and the cure or the antidote, if you will. Project management's helping make sure that projects are delivered on time, uh, that they're actually aligned, strategically aligned, that the resource allocation is more efficient, that you know the budget overruns have decreased, et cetera, et cetera. Expectations, the most uh, in purple there, the from the bottom, the, the highest ranking one, uh, expectations are managed more effectively. Yeah, critical. So they're just a summary of some of the pressures that we'll uh, yeah, suffer both external and internal as when we're delivering legal matters. So what we'd like you to do now, we're going to try a little bit of a, this is going to be interactive. It's not just going to be me lecturing at you for the next, uh, what have we got there, 45 minutes left. Um, yeah, 
this is gonna, we're going to try something new. So, if you can all please go to, uh, the, you got the, you, either you provide the link, and if you're not, then you can go to www.slido.com and enter the code. You can see there hashtag CLI one, and we've got a question we're going to ask you. What are the greatest pressures facing you as a I've gone, I've gone legal, but as a project manager, as someone who delivers legal work, or maybe you're in legal ops and you're delivering you know, projects within a law firm environment, what are the, some of the greatest pressures facing you? Now, you can answer as many times as you want, um, uh, but please just one answer at a time. Try and keep it short, like one word, two words. Don't write an essay uh, because we're going to have it in a bit of a word cloud. So let's try this. And up on screen. Um, I think we can see some things happening already. Um, and I hope for, uh, Terry can let me know if you can't, uh, let me know if you can't see it up on screen. I'm just gonna make the assumption that everyone can. We're all good, Peter, we can see. Brilliant. We've got a pretty clear winner at the moment. And this is always one of those things now because, um, because people see the, yeah. Oh, and communication because people see the word and they start to get, um, you know, maybe influenced by what they see up on the screen. Um, but yeah, okay. Yeah, you can see this kind of evolving. We'll give uh, give you just a couple more. Uh, give the respondents just a couple more. Uh, maybe another thirty seconds just to to get everyone's responses. And I should point out that there will be, um, uh, we'll take uh, questions at the end. Um, we'll see how long the how long the piece goes. Um, I estimated that I'd probably have about uh, about thirty to forty minutes worth of material, uh, and it left some space at the end, back end for questions. Uh, so if you do have a burning question or you see some things that surprise you, for example, uh, please take note of it. Uh, uh, use the the Q and A function through through Zoom, and uh, I won't be looking at them right now. But uh, when we get to to the end of the session, uh, Terry and I will jump in and we'll start working through those as well. All right. So in terms of, let's just, I'll, I'll start talking to the results so we can see them kind of starting to consolidate around a theme around you know, greatest pressures facing you as a, a project management, uh, communication and collaboration uh, uh, you know, with some, you know, some remote working, which is un, you know, not surprising, uh, change, uh, tech, uh, remote again. Um, so yeah, and let's look at some of the other ones around understanding, unrealistic timeline, strategy, winning. <laughs> uh, Silos, shifting priorities, yeah, uh, change. Okay, so that's actually not surprising at all. Did you, uh, interest, fun, well, maybe not word fun isn't the right term, but uh, a fact is uh, the leading cause of complaint against lawyers in both New South Wales and Victoria, and as I understand it, Canada, um, year on year, um, is communication. It's a leading cause of professional complaint, right up there with negligence. It usually vies with negligence as the leading cause of complaint, which is, um, yeah, really, uh, it's a, uh, an, it's an indict, indictment of a statement, isn't it? That it's uh, it, communication is a perennial issue of uh, of our profession, and again, unsurprisingly, also considering the guild nature or origins of our profession. Originally, we were a guild, and therefore, we started with very much one sided communication. Uh, with significant disparity in knowledge and power distance. Uh, and as the profession has moved corporatized, uh, so to our clients have expected much more robust communication and collaboration with them. They no longer just accept us to pronounce our, you know, and our, our diagnosis and give them a document in, in legalese, which they can't understand. Increasingly, they're expecting to be part, you know, understand what's going on, understand why it's happening and when it's happening. Okay, so that's been fascinating. Let's jump back into the, um, the presentation now. Okay, so next section. Let's see what the impact of all these different, we talked about all these different types of pressure. Now let's talk about what impact they actually have on your project decisions. So, we're going to get into the graph on the left-hand side in just a moment. It's the Yerkes-Dordson law uh, or graph, and I've got a, a great little uh, 
video from from Harvard, uh, which will uh, which I'll show you in just a moment. But before we get there, um, let's define stress. And I've given you a definition up on screen. Yeah, it's the experience, the discomfort, it's the fear, the appreh apprehension, uh, anxiety uh, that we all feel when we are under a degree of pressure. Regardless of where that pre whether it's internal to the project or whether it's macro pressure, if we're, we're personally feeling pressure, it has a physiological and a psychological impact upon us, otherwise known as stress. Uh, interesting piece of research which suggested that actually for the average person, um, if they are under significant stress, it actually ha has the impact of an equivalent of a temporary drop in their IQ of 15, 15 points. So stress actually does, to a degree, impair cognitive performance. And there's some interesting research done by, uh, by NASA uh, into this, as you can imagine, they, uh, they and their, their astronauts and their pilots and uh, even the people in mission control have to be able to deal with highly stressful projects and scenarios. So they've done a fair degree of research into how stress impacts decision making. Um, and what they discovered, you can see a couple of bullet points there, but I'll talk you through them. So when someone is initially in a situation, they do an initial, initial evaluation of the situation and they identify it as stressful. And then they'll followed by a couple of iterative reassessments to work out if it is still uh, stressful. And that, that constantly happens. Uh, if it is stressful, usually emotions surface. And those emotions tend to undermine having a goal-directed focus. Uh, once we've got that situation, we then start to, or individuals under stress, start to narrow their attention span uh, or their situ situational awareness which kind of decreases. And along with that, they start to have uh, a loss in concurrent task management or you know, more of a singular focus as I've described it. Uh, now, if this all continues, the following performance issues can really start to surface. We start to see poor decision-making and the, uh, the encoding of new information. Uh, we start to see a potentially a shifting of project strategy you know, quick, fast and loose with where they're heading. Um, and or you might say, there's this task shedding. Just go, oh, no, I'm just, we're just forget it. We just won't do steps three, you know, D through E. Um, and you also see uh, you know, less team performance, less nurturing collaborative behavior, picking up on what people find hard and, you know, one of the, uh, you know, one of the pressures of project management. And we see a reduction in some of the team building initiatives and behaviors. So that's according to NASA, what some of the immediate impacts of stress are on our decision making. Now, I've now got, a, I've got about, a, it's a two minute long video, uh, which I'll just go to now, which kind of talks through um, this yerkes dodson law. All right, okay, let's just kind of talk you through what, I, what we were just seeing there then. Uh, so the idea is, okay, so here's, you've got, you've, you've got your graph. Um, and the idea is that for, basically for, uh, for tasks, um, that are, are really simple. Um, you're going to uh, you know, usually require a degree of stress in order to find them interesting enough to do. Uh, of course, it also goes too far the other way. And if suddenly you're doing tasks uh, and you have a huge amount of stress, that starts to actually impair your performance because you can see there's strong anxiety. And it suggested that the shape of the curve actually changes according to how simple or how complex the task is, which is where it was going here. So uh, in this case, this would be for a highly complex task where you don't actually need a huge amount of stress to find it interesting because it's already pretty complex and you've got your cognitive load is already pretty high. Uh, alternatively, this would be for a pretty simple task where uh, you actually need, a, it's suggesting you need a, you know, a degree of stress to actually find it interesting, which is perhaps why people you know, sometimes leave things, you know, or, you know, admin and you know, things they might find a little bit less uh, interesting or you know, things they find boring, they leave to the last minute. Um, and then they suddenly incur a lot of stress and get it done. Uh, oh, sorry, I'm go back one. There we go. Uh, then, uh, and that did a bit of analysis in terms of, it did some scoring. Uh, it did this across thousands of people and it said they got people to score their, their average stress levels between basically one and 40. And it sound, found that the average score was about 13 for people. Uh, and that was kind of their optimal stress score, if you will. You know, 
And then you know, some people were really high and they were obviously unproductive and some people were really low and obviously they, were, you know, they didn't have sufficient stress to get, to get out of bed in the morning. Um, so they thought 13 was about a good number. And uh, then they did some bit of you know, uh, demographic analysis uh, and what they discovered is that the older you get, the less stressed you become. Um, uh, possibly because you've uh, you've got a better sense of uh, perspective in terms of you know what the causes of you know, of that stress. Uh, it also did analysis by uh, and possibly some of these related in terms of income, uh, in, in terms of uh, educo- uh, education. Uh, they even did a bit of a gender analysis. Uh, so yeah, it was a bit of it was a very fascinating piece of research that they did. Uh, be interested, you know, people have their own thoughts about whether that applies to uh, their own their own lived experience. Um, but I've, I've got the link there um, and uh, I believe that at uh, some points the slides might be distributed. So uh, you'll get to, to click on that and actually listen to it as opposed to me narrating it. Uh, right, so let's move on. So we've talked about um, so pressures and the impact that pressures can have in the form of stress and the fact that it impacts upon our decision making. Uh, And just to kind of uh, dive into that a little bit uh, as a bit of a, I guess, an interesting FYI for you, we have here um, a codex of human cognitive biases. Uh, I've given a link there so you can go in and uh, explore it as you will. Uh, In fact, I've I've got it loaded up on screen so um, just to kind of give you a sense of what it is because it's pretty cool. when you go into it, you can see all of these different stresses. And uh, I don't know if you can see on screen as I click through them, uh, it highlights them. And these are all linked to their own Wikipedia pages. So you can go in there and have a whole bunch of fun uh, and learn about how fallible human decision making really is. Uh, But a couple in particular, um, or groupings that are in particular are quite relevant to us in terms of dealing with a crisis or dealing with a scenario uh, a bit of an urgent scenario or a project even you know so we usually we need to act fast uh, and usually we don't have enough information to make those types of decisions Uh, and that's where we start to do things like we uh, you can see up on the left hand side here you know we start to favor things that are immediate and relatable things in front of us rather than theoretical Uh, we start to project our current mindset and assumptions onto the past and the future uh, just so we can quickly get moving. We just quickly make decisions or we haven't got enough meaning. Uh, we tend to, we assume we know what other people are thinking about. We simplify probabilities and numbers. Uh, you know, uh, and we even fill in characteristics from stereotypes, uh, uh, schemas, prior histories, where we just to fill in the gaps in terms of the data sets. So lots of cognitive biases there for us to... Uh, to be fallible on. Uh, but back to the presentation. And I've listed a couple out there that I normally in particular call out in regards to, to project management, uh, particularly estimating. Uh, so we've got optimism bias and planning fallacy, which are very similar to each other, uh, where we tend to underestimate the probability of undesirable outcomes or underestimate the costs and the resources required. And then we tend to overestimate the probability of favorable outcomes or the benefits of the same actions. Um, we've got biases like negativity bias, where we, we tend to remember things that hurt us more than things that were good. Um, normalcy bias, so we tend to uh, not incorporate into our decision-making things which are kind of outside of our lived experience. Um, now, no one really planned for, um, for COVID-19, did they? It, probably, yeah, it wasn't really within most people's planning uh, horizon uh, because we don't plan for the one in you know, one in 100 year event, maybe for the one in five year event. And, uh, and just a good measure, pessimism bias, uh, because that's usually a, a personality trait of, of lawyers. And just to kind of point out that, you know, we've got both optimism bias and pessimism bias here, which basically means we're a hot mess when it comes to decision making, uh, so, which is why we need structured processes to help us through it. Uh, so if we could just do a bit of a summation of where we're at at the moment. Check, time check. Okay, it's so halfway. Uh, so there are multiple external and internal sources of pressures on projects, we've gone through those. Um, we can be project team members and leaders. We can become stressed. We can, uh, when we're under pressure. And depending upon how complex or standardized the project team that is, uh, team members can have a so-called optimal amount of stress for peak performance to be a high performing team. But too much stress will result in poor decision-making 
and cognitive biases, um, task shedding or the dropping of key tasks and poor approaches to collaboration and team building. So time to jump back on uh, Slido again. Uh, let's try this one for it worked quite well. This one's a, a much easier one. It's just going to be a uh, just going to be a multiple choice. So I'll jump up and I'll activate this now. So jump on again and you should see uh, the new question appearing. So do you feel that you generally operate with an optimal amount of stress? Give you all a couple of minutes just to finish that one. Well, that's, that was a quick response from everyone. Thank you for that. Okay, that's actually that's very heartening news. Uh, that. Um, Majority of you, nearly half of you, uh, often feeling the operating with the optimal amounts, uh, and then, uh, but somewhat disconcertingly, almost an equal number um, uh, in the, uh, the only the sometimes, and then uh, still it's not a small minority, rarely. Um, which certainly, I can think back to last year uh, where one of the law society journals actually was entitled "The Burnout Profession." I don't know if you remember that one. They had quite a, a visual burned out piece of paper kind of cover. Um, certainly uh, there are issues like uh, self-care and psychological safety are you know, becoming, at least now becoming more normative discussion points. And we'll actually touch upon that, uh, some of them uh, later in this session. Uh, so thank you for that feedback. Let's jump back into the presentation again. Okay. Oh, I forgot. That's right. I had the second question. Lovely. Um, all right. Part two of the question. Sorry, guys. Here we go. Uh, is so. This one's an interesting one. What areas do you think you're most impacted on when you are stressed? And you can choose up to three answers here. So you can have three up to three votes. But if you had to prioritise what you thought were some of the things that impacted you the most uh, when you were stressed, uh, have a go. Yeah, that's fascinating results, isn't it? So I, t I totally hear the poor concurrent task management uh, and yeah, the loss of the sense of team. People start to become quite, can become quite, I guess, uh, it, it, more siloed, um, more individual in their approach uh, and more focus, laser focus just on the particular tasks at hand. And what we're losing is some of that, you know, that, that situational awareness uh, or the ability to do, you know, to basically do the, the multitasking, uh, which is you know, very rarely uh, are we as lawyers in a position where we get the luxury of just working on one legal matter at one time. Normally uh, it is many legal matters all at the same time uh, or we're dealing with multiple requests uh, simultaneously. Uh, and so you can see what, you know, obviously why that's such a concern then when we are stressed, because that's one of the key things that we oftentimes are required to do. Okay, so with all that said, now for the now for the good stuff, now for the way you tuned in. How are you actually going to manage all of this? Uh, so I, I kind of alluded to it a couple of minutes ago, uh, the concept of a crisis. Uh, let's just use this as a kind of a form of example, because... Uh, the crisis is an extreme form of pressure. That it's uh, it's where it, you know, read up on screen, but it's, it's an unexpected threat to a project. Usually occurs within, uh, usually has a, a fairly short time frame for decision making, and it's going to have quite a material and substantive impact upon that project. Uh, you can see that you know, it really disrupts the project's activities to the point where you know you've got to make new decisions that you hadn't played, you hadn't planned for in order for the project to continue. Uh, there are plenty of authors which suggest that crises in projects are basically inevitable. Uh, if not always, but, it, but at least certainly not in every single project, but inevitably you'll come across one or more. Uh, 
So there's normally, uh, literature suggests, um, and I've got a couple of resources down there from the Project Management Institute about how uh, crises will typically escalate. Now, we start off with this concept of snowballing. Uh, normally, there'll be uh, multiple different pressures, which then start to progressively become in intertwined. Uh, now, at first, the signals of going something going wrong with the project are usually quite small and weak, and they're perceived as, uh, they're, they're exceptional, they're perceived as independent of each other. No one really sees the big picture, realizing that that little weak signal over there and that one there and that one there are actually all connected. And by the time they do start to realize it is, and that's just why it's called snowballing, and once they start to realize they're all starting to be connected, usually by a stage, more stakeholders have become involved in the process. And the problem is when the stakeholders become involved, what do they try and do? Well, they try and minimize the pressure upon themselves. Usually, and some inadvertently or hopefully not maliciously, by shifting the pressure onto other project stakeholders, who in turn get this new pressure and then try and shift it back. So we end up with this bit of a, a downward cycle emerges, if you will, uh, which ultimately leads to a crisis. And at which point, um, usually at this point, other more outside stakeholders, and uh, they might, you know, depending on the nature of the crisis, they could be the public, they could be a higher form of management, they could be political powers, they could be the media. Normally, these ex broader external stakeholders have now started to become involved as well. And when they become involved, they decrease the capabilities of the original parties to solve their own problems. And basically, the whole thing becomes too complicated and too big for any one party to solve. It becomes a crisis. Uh, for those of you who had the uh, the pleasure of watching um, uh, the TV series miniseries uh, Chernobyl, uh, which I've uh, recently embarked upon, um, I've got a screen capture there. Uh, that, uh, if for those of you who've seen it, you'll recognise that the um, pretty much the entire series, but in particular the first episode, really explains uh, and shows in precise form what a crisis looks like and they are pretty much textbook for doing all the wrong things uh, in all the wrong orders. Uh, but yes, absolutely this idea of weak initial signals uh, which snowballed, um, they had a lot of blame shifting between key stakeholders and then by the time uh, it got so big that we had government ministers and other people uh, and other committees coming, coming involved, suddenly became, the military got involved and suddenly it became this huge thing. Uh, I think, I think even Gorbachev apparently was quoted at some point as saying, suggesting that Chernobyl was one of the real reasons for the downfall of the USSR. Uh, so, crisis indeed. So, what do we do in a crisis? Well, it's going to come as no surprise to you, being um, uh, me being a legal project manager and this being a topic of project management, the solution does lie in good pre-planning to reduce pressure and surprises. Uh, got a couple of resources down there, including uh, by the Australian public service. Uh, there's even a, a British standard on crisis management and across all of these resources, it's fairly ubiquitous in its, uh, in their advice suggesting that pre-planning is critical. Uh, so, yeah, having the discipline to first understand the big picture. What are we trying to achieve? What does good luck, good look like? Is this actually a priority and have we done this before? And if we have the discipline to ask those big picture questions before we then get into the more detailed planning around work breakdown structures, stakeholder identification, budgeting and, and communication in terms of how we're going to internally track progress and how we're going to communicate that progress to external stakeholders and how we're going to track and changes and resolve disagreements. So it comes down to good pre-planning rather than trying to respond in the moment to have trying to foreseen some of these risks and accommodate them accordingly. Uh, just as a side note, for those who aren't aware, uh, we had a little bit of a victory. Project management has actually now been recognised, just kind of on the topic, as actually now one of the clock core 12 competencies. I've just got it. This is just an excerpt straight from uh, the text is directly copied from the clock website. But does in kind of underscore, previously project management actually wasn't on there. Um, but we've been, uh, there's been a group of us campaigning and we've got it up there. Um, but just kind of underscores the yeah, the, the recognised importance of, of project management. Uh, now, they're saying, obviously, within a legal ops context, I'm saying it applies both legal ops and for legal matters in the form of legal project management, but it's just a recognition of the importance and relevance of, of project management 
to helping us manage pressures. Uh, over the next couple of, what I'm going to do for the next couple of minutes, because uh, uh, I don't know if those joining the call have sat through my LPM training previously, but for those who haven't, I'm just going to give you a five minute run, very quick run through of some, when I say project management in a legal context, what it actually physically looks like. So you've got some context for it. Uh, this is a work breakdown structure. Uh, this is a fancy form of a checklist. Uh, no doubt you already have task lists to do plan, you know, to manage what you're doing. Uh, this is a best practice form of a checklist. Uh, it, it describes what's going to be done, who's responsible, when it's due, and the status. Uh, because if you're missing any one or more of those elements, it becomes increasingly hard to actually manage what you're doing. If you don't know what you're doing, who's doing it, when it's due, or if it's done. Uh, so highly recommend, even at, a, even at a high level with phases and just a couple of key tasks, uh, putting your work into a work breakdown structure. Uh, provides a bit of pre-planning. Uh, we've got stakeholder, stakeholder identification and management. Um, there's the RACI model, responsible, accountable, consulted and informed as a way of classifying stakeholders, uh, responsible, normally that's your, you, uh, accountable, that's who you're basically, who signs off on the work. Uh, oftentimes that can be a problem in terms of, if, particularly if you've got multiple parties who believe they are accountable or you know, and are giving you potentially conflicting directions, are consulted. Uh, that's trying to work out which stakeholders actually need to you know, usefully provide input into your project and informed is our reporting, how we're reporting and how, in what manner. Um, there's a similar but different tool for managing stakeholders. It's the influence versus interest matrix that I referred to earlier. Uh, it's a very Machiavellian approach to stakeholder identification, let me tell you. Um, but it just recognises that if a stakeholder doesn't have much influence and they don't really have much interest in your project, we're not going to invest the same level of in effort in managing them as we would a stakeholder that had a high level of influence and a high degree of interest in our project, whom we would manage closely. And there are shandies for keep satisfied and keep informed. These are really simple tools that you don't, you, know, you don't have to have expansive documentation for all these. are really simple things you can do, even almost as a mental checklist uh, at the start of a project, just to help you make sure that you've identified all the relevant parties. And most importantly, for example, on the right-hand side, that the members of your team have a similar approach and classify the same stakeholders in the same way. So you're all treating the same, you're all managing closely the same stakeholders. Uh, Told you it was going to be quick. Uh, so then team formations. Uh, this is based upon uh, Tuckman's model of uh, team formation, the forming, storming, norming, and performing. Um, we can really simplify it down to the first, the first two of the most important ones, uh, where when we get a team together, when you get a team together to work on a project, even if they've worked together before, they are still a collection of individuals. You as the project leader know why they're together. They don't. So we need to articulate what the vision is, what our expectations are, what the resources are going to be available, and then how the governance, how they're actually going to work together. Who's in charge? If there's a disagreement, how do they resolve it? Too often, we expect teams to just fall into the norming stage. Yep, they've worked together before, they're in the same organisation, why can't they just immediately be a high-performing team? No, we have to step through, and it might even, this can be covered off in a kickoff meeting. This can be covered off in the first, this can be covered off in 10 minutes, but just getting a clear vision and who's in charge and what the clear roles are means that the team doesn't spend time tripping over itself. Uh, closely related to the concept of a high-performing team is the concept of a psychologically safe team. Um, because one of the key elements of a high-performing team is the concept of trust. Uh, without trust, teams can't be high-performing. Yeah, that, that governance structure that I referred to on the previous slide is really about helping the team members start to trust each other and understand where they're heading. Uh, so as you kind of, there's an excellent resource by Amy Edmondson, which you can see on the, uh, which I've got linked to the bottom there. Um, if you want to go and uh, do a bit more uh, deep dive into this. Uh, but the idea of psychologically safe team is you can read through these bullet points here and similar and ask us, yeah, can you answer these in the in the affirmative? Uh, and you really want to lead by example as a team leader uh, and set, yeah, be the change you want to see. I think it was Gandhi, right? Uh, stemming on from the similar related to the concept of trust is uh, knowing when to delegate because yeah, lawyers being low trust individuals, why trust other humans? I'm going to do it all myself. They wouldn't do it right anyway. But increasingly, and in particular, relating it back to the idea of a crisis or where your matter is complex, um, you know, think, of, think about our uh, uh, the data I showed you, the survey responses to people dealing with COVID. You know, most of the time is dealing with new 
un, you know, uncertain advice, stuff they haven't had to deal with before. So, you know, unfamiliar legal content. Uh, you know, or if you've got stakeholders that need frequent consultation, they're really high need, you know, need to hold their hand, they're high need stakeholders. Uh, you've got complex interdependent work streams, multiple teams, large teams in multiple locations, everyone's working from home. You've got a complex matter. And at that point in time, what's the project manager have to do? They need to spend more time managing and not on the tools, not in the weeds, but stepping back, clarifying and communicating changes, engaging with stakeholders, managing resources and bottlenecks, resolving issues. That's where an increasing amount of their time should be spent. And that's like, just bear that concept in mind as we get into our final section where we're talking about what could leadership behaviours look like, which we'll touch in just a couple of minutes. Um, another key area, just a quick summarise about risk, because uh, uh, that's a key part of what we'll be dealing with in terms of managing under pressure and managing crises is risk assessment. So the definition of risk, there's the, there's the ISO definition. It's the effective uncertainty on objectives. Uh, you may have seen uh, a risk matrix before where we classify, this is a usual way of how you classify risk between likelihood and the impact it has. Uh, main, don't get hung up on the numbers. The main thing is it's a relative classification scheme. So it just helps you, and you know, the traffic light is really helpful, red or green and you know, yellow. Just helps you identify things which are bad versus things which aren't as bad. Uh, and if you're just after a, you know, some quick ways to help you make sure that you've actually covered off all the risks. Well, I mentioned at the start PESTLE uh, as a way of trying to identify some macro risks that might affect your project. And also, uh, we've got there a list of legal risks uh, that have resulted from law cover claims. So, very pertinent, specific risks uh, for being a lawyer and delivering legal services, uh, which you may choose to, you know, kind of in your own time, read through and be aware of. Now, the final thing I wanted to touch in this little 10-minute absolute speed through uh, project management tools and to help you better plan to deal with um, to deal with crises and to deal with pressure um, is agile. And I want to the reason I'm ending on this one is because it's quite relevant to dealing with uncertainty. Uh, those of you who haven't worked in an agile environment before, um, depending upon the type of legal work you do, you may well have. You just didn't realise. Um, I'll describe our agile to you by referencing the Mona Lisa. Um, so the idea is if we're in an agile environment, we start off with a, a rough concept of what the, what we want to do. In this case, it's a rough sketch of the Mona Lisa. Now, we, haven't got too many, we know it's going to be a, a female form with some background. Okay. Um, and what we do is we have a what's called a sprint, but we have a turn of the documents and we come up with a something, an output. And it looks okay. We've colored it in and looks okay. It's a bit rough around the edges. Uh, but that could be the equivalent of, say, someone who's come in in a litigation context and gone, hey, I just want you know, some initial advice. Or in a regulatory context, I just want some initial advice. Or maybe it's just a initial heads of terms in a contractual context. And importantly, what you do then is you ask the, the, pro the owner of the, the person that's engaged you, or the person that needs these services, you ask, are we done? And guess what? You might be. Maybe that's all they wanted. Maybe that's all they needed this was an initial piece of advice. And if what, guess what? Happy days. You're done. You can move on with your life. You can get on to the next project. Um, but often, maybe you're not. So maybe they say, say, okay, well, actually, no, I need more detail. And so you come up another turn of the documents and you deliver something a little bit more advanced. Maybe it's now a fleshed out heads of terms. Maybe it's a little bit more. Maybe we've started to collect a little bit of evidence. Um, and we ask again. Okay, and we make another assessment. You really want to proceed? And it's like, are we done? And they're like, oh, no, maybe we're done. Or maybe we're not. And so we keep iterating until we finally get to something that, as far as the client's concerned, and we're concerned, is done. This is really good. It's you know, There's a different couple of ways of calling this. It's uh, incremental de development, iterative development. It's got many different terms, um, including agile. But the idea is that it's really good where you don't have an exact idea. You're in an uncertain environment. And you have to iteratively develop the process. So you kind of you develop an output, then up Periscope. Are we still heading in the right direction? Yes. All right. We're going to plan for the next little bit. Uh, in terms of uh, best practice behaviors, uh, so some of the things to help you, again, deal with pressure um, and deal with crises and un uh, you know, unforeseen environments, making sure at the front that we do have clarity of scope, timeframes, and roles. So definitely holding a kickoff meeting. Um, in the Agile concepts, uh, really having a def clear definition of done or a clear definition of scope uh, and making sure that we have really good communication with the team. Again, harking back to the, you know, one of the challenges, what everyone on the call said, you know, one of their challenges of 
when they're under pressure is communication. Uh, some of the tools to do that would be having a stand-ups. Uh, it's, a, you know, it's like me, it's a standing up, it's not a sit down, it's a quick meeting. It's meant to be real quick, 10, 15 minutes. Um, and it's where the team members come just talk about what they're currently working on and any impediments. <laughs> it's meant to be for the next, say, what they're doing for the next week. Importantly, and I beg you for this one, when you have these project control meetings, these stand-ups, do one thing. Talk about the, the planning of the matter. Don't get, avoid uh, trying uh, getting caught up in the legal issues because it's what happened. I've sat through too many project planning meetings and this is exactly what happens. The lawyers start talking about the legal stuff because that's the interesting bit. And then we just don't leave, they don't leave time to actually deal with all the, all the, all the boring tasks, status and tracking. Oh no, we'll do that later. If you're setting a time, side time for a stand up, devote it to doing the project governance and the project tracking. Um, definitely, we need to be communicating the change of constraints to all relevant stakeholders. Um, and uh, preferably, we've got a collaboration space for actually project relevant information. You know, everyone knows I'm a big fan of OneNote, uh, but there are plenty of other uh, tools that do you know, matter management platforms, practice management, case management platforms that all do start to do the same thing. Uh, right, so one more Slido, uh, and then we'll get into the final section. When a project crisis happens, how often do you actually feel adequately prepared? Bearing in mind that the whole point of this is to try and have pre-prepared, pre-planned and pre-prepared. Uh, if you look at some of the crisis management uh, and emergency management materials developed by the Australian government uh, and even NASA and other and the likes, uh, it's all about preparedness. Uh, so, yeah, sometimes. Uh, uh, yeah, a, a, a bit, a bit often a bit really, so a bit of a bell curve there, which isn't, yeah, strong sometimes, which isn't surprising. Uh, and oftentimes we'll probably have done it uh, just for the really, really big matters um, and have, didn't have to do it for some of the smaller stuff, uh, which can certainly throw us off when it happens. Right, I think we've got about five minutes left. Um, so let's go into project leadership during a crisis. Great, I only got a couple of slides here, um, but some interesting stuff. Uh, so, when the environment is uncertain and it's defined by uncertain, uh, by urgency and a lack of information, you know, in those circumstances, waiting to decide is actually making a decision in itself, right? So we had a look at NASA, a great resource of material and stuff. Uh, now, they focus on data-driven analysis uh, in a crisis. Uh, and so, what their mission control is able to do is establish a, a data-driven environment so that even in the midst of a, a, a potential crisis, uh, their, their process mitigates against uh, past strategies uh, or past outcomes, successful outcomes, uh, biasing their understanding about the new crisis. So that they don't go, oh, hey, well, that worked. I know that worked three times previously. It's definitely bound to work this time. They make sure that they... they uh, driven by the data more than anything. So um, that was a great, great quote actually. By that was an uh, extensive interview with someone that was a uh, someone who was a basic kind of like a mission control uh, manager. So it would it would manage actual uh, space missions. And he had this great quote about yeah, you always get a little bit more information. We can panic later on. <laughs> it's the, it's the keep calm, uh, keep calm and carry on kind of approach to things. Um, but you can see that these are some of the questions that he thought a leader. Uh, should be asking, uh, yeah, what does data actually say about the situation at hand? Uh, what is the worst thing that could happen as a result of the situation? Uh, does, do I and does the team have enough information to know for sure that is the worst thing and how could we always get more information? And what immediate things can I do right now to continue making the project progress? Uh, and to kind of which leads into then, uh, this is my, my final slide, uh, some of the behaviours of crisis decision-making, what a good project leader should be doing in order to help uh, bring order to the chaos. Uh, so first of all, and this is actually taken a uh, source from, you can see resource here from McKinsey, uh, but I've drawn a couple of other resources in here as well. Uh, first of all, breathe. Uh, yeah, taking a taking that broader perspective, um, trying to rise above the, you know, the maelstrom of the moment, getting all poetic here. Uh, and you know, really try and create that 30,000 foot view. Um, you know, so asking what is most important right now? And you know, what might I be missing? Uh, yeah, how might things unfold from here? 
and what could we do now to uh, you know, to make that happen, a good outcome happen? Uh, it's really interesting. It's like the idea is to try and actually try and, by breathing, you're actually trying to return yourself to your uh, parasympathetic nervous system. That's actually the, the the system in your body that helps you return to a quieter pre-threat state of yeah a, a psychological being. Oh, sorry, a physiological being. Uh, so breathing, trying to return yourself back to a calm state, uh, involving more people. Oftentimes people think crisis management, no, we're just going to you know, hunker down, go into command HQ with a, you know, two or three people and just going to make the decisions. No, no, no. The idea is that you actually want uh, pluralism, anti-positivism. We actually want the truth is out there and the truth is multiple different perspectives. So you actually want more stakeholders to encourage different views and debate. Now, that's not anarchy. They're suggesting that's still within a clear governance structure. So the way you can do this is by encouraging views and debate by, by clarifying the decisions that need to be made, clarifying the respective roles of who's a decision maker, who's a contributor, and, and who's someone who's going to be an implementer of those decisions, and then creating a forum for rapid debate, accepting that everyone might have, an, people get to have an opinion, but not everyone gets to vote. You know, there's still going to be some order in who actually makes the decision. Um, so the idea is for the leader to really remain curious and flexible. Uh, making critical small choices. Ah, uh, yes. So trying to plan for multiple scenarios and then with other stakeholders, trying to develop a prioritized list of choices that if we made today would have a material impact later on. It's a bit like the butterfly effect, if you've heard of that one before. Uh, establishing what they've, I like the terminology here, a nerve center. Uh, now, these are really cross-functional teams. They've all got clear mandates, but there's a governance structure to make sure that they all collaborate and integrate. Um, the idea is that leaders want to focus on tactical strategic decisions and not tactical decisions. Um, you know, strategic decisions, they normally come with a high degree of uncertainty, uh, a large likelihood that things will change, uh, and they're usually quite difficult to assess the costs and the benefits uh, and can result in sometimes simultaneous outcomes, which makes them really hard. Uh, you know, tactical decisions obviously come with much more clear objectives, they're clear, clear defined, a lower degree of uncertainty. So they're best left to more tacticians or operatives, leaving the leader to focus on the strategic stuff. And the idea of uh, go big or go home. Yes, uh, oftentimes uh, in past crises, we've seen leaders actually tend to underreact. Uh, you know, we've seen it in relation to the COVID crisis. Certain, uh, you know, certain governments have been on the back foot and certain governments have been very much on the, uh, on the front foot. So the idea is if you can, uh, try, and, try and be bold and make a, you know, a, a bold and rapid decision that sometimes might be assessed as too risky in normal times. So, I think that will bring us all to, let's just jump on that. Um, I've left a whole negative one minute for questions. Uh, so, Terry, uh, I'll be guided by you and how you want to run with this. Um, I'm happy to, you know, perhaps I can read the questions and maybe uh, in a bit of a Q&A format, I might respond to them in writing and maybe I could send them out to, uh, as, a, as an email response to people. Uh, how would you like to, what do you recommend? Peter, we've got um, one quick question, if you wouldn't yeah. mind um, yeah, just responding to it here, because I think it's probably one that will apply and be of interest to a lot of folks. So it's from Eliza. Um, and the question is, what sort of data should we be collecting to draw on in a legal crisis? So a, cri a legal crisis. So a crisis, uh, okay, so, um, and by legal crisis, you mean a, uh, so any crisis where a in-house team or a lawyer has been asked to, you know, it's on a matter and the matter has crisis, uh, a sense of urgency about it. The data would be, go back to what we said, actually I'll flip back to the slide, in terms of, I'm not sure what data it says actually about the situation. Without knowing the nature of the crisis, it's hard to understand. But certainly I would be trying to understand um, what, what the current impact is who the key stakeholders impacted are, uh, you know, what the what the likely effect is, and what are the do you, what current options do you have available? Not fanciful options, but what are your clear current options, and what's the impact of those? So trying to cut it down to just a kind of a few key decisions uh, that you can make meaningfully make right now, and what the impact of those those clear decisions would be. 
that would be my initial if that kind of you think that answers the question for I, I do and yeah. certainly we would as you suggested welcome um, any other questions that um, you could respond to personally please um, obviously email us at cli at collaw.edu.au and we'd be very happy to pass those on mm -hmm. to Peter and I know he would be very happy to communicate with you as well Love it. Um, or with you directly so Peter thank you very much indeed for a brilliant mm -hmm. presentation really uh, insightful, helpful, practical, um, all of the things that we were hoping for. So thank you for delivering 110%. Really, really appreciate that. 110% um, of, of time, unfortunately. <laughs> no, no worries, no worries. Uh, a huge thank you to everyone who attended as well. Um, it was a real pleasure to have you back um, at the centre and participating in one of our webinars. Just a quick reminder that the Reinvent Legal Business uh, series is a series of webinars and podcasts. So there are others coming up. The next one we have coming up is on remote working uh, with Catherine Thomas, and we would very much welcome your participation in that as well. Um, look out for these on LinkedIn, Twitter or Facebook. They're being announced all over the place and uh, you're very welcome to attend them. The entire series is free. And on that note, Peter, I also would like to acknowledge you particularly for donating your time today and contributing to the series. We uh, very much appreciate that as well. Very absolute pleasure. So again, thank you very much. We look forward to seeing you again. And Peter, thank you. And um, we'll sign off for now. Bye, everyone. Bye.